Well, the first week that we did a live stream here at First Press Church was March the 22nd. You know, in some ways, it's, it really does seem like another lifetime. But I remember on that day, I talked about solidarity. How important it is to know that you are surrounded by people who share what you're going through, people who have the same experience as you do, people who are in some way family. How important it is just to have that sense of solidarity. And on that week, March the 22nd, COVID was still fairly new. And it was frightening, I think, for many of us. We were under this lockdown. The first kind of experience we ever had with anything to do with the lockdown for many of us in our lives, and there was so much uncertainty about that. But there was also, we knew, a solidarity, not just in this church, and not just in Collingwood, and not just in Ontario, and not just in Canada, but there was a solidarity around the whole world because we knew everybody was going through the same thing. And we remember seeing pictures of people on their balconies singing and playing instruments to each other across apartment courtyards. And we remember that feeling of sharing the same struggle with so many people. Well, now here we are in this week, and we're still going through the struggle of COVID, but now we have a struggle of another kind. There's these issues around racial injustice that just won't go away, and the reason they won't go away is because they need to be dealt with. And we've seen protests here in Collingwood and all around our country and all around the world. And I sense a same kind of solidarity in that, that at some point, people just long for justice. At some point, no matter who you are, you realize that something just isn't right and that something needs to be done about it. Now, it's true that some people aren't excited about pursuing that goal of justice for whatever reason, but I'm convinced that the vast majority of people around the world are pursuing that goal of justice because the Bible says we are born with a thirst for justice. Solidarity was so important to the person of Jesus, and in the last week of his life, of all the things that Jesus could have prayed about, that was front and center for Jesus. The last week of his life, here's what Jesus prayed. First, he prayed for his disciples. I will remain in the world no longer, Jesus prayed. He knew that he was leaving, and he also told his friends and his disciples that he was leaving. But they, that's the disciples, they're still in the world. So God, protect them by the power of your name so that they may be one as we are one. Jesus traveled with those people for three years. He got to know them well. In the end, he called them friends. And it's not surprising that Jesus would have prayed for his own disciples and his own friends. And Jesus had said to them earlier that it's by the love that they have for each other that the whole world will know what the faith is and who the real God is. But then Jesus prayed for other people beyond his own disciples. Jesus prayed, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but, for, but also for all who will ever believe in the power of your love. Now Jesus is moving out of this group that might seem exclusive to some people. Now he's praying for everybody. And Jesus says, I pray that they, that's everyone, they will all be one, just as you and I are one. Jesus is praying God. He had a relationship with God so close that he called God Father. Now, we've talked about that before. God has no gender. It could have been mother. The point is that Jesus was so intimate with God and one with God. And now Jesus is praying, I want the whole world to know what it's like to be that one as I am one with you, Father God. It's an amazing prayer. And this goes beyond the solidarity that we feel when we're with people who are like us. 
This goes way beyond the solidarity of birds with a feather flock together. Now it's solidarity of everybody. And this is what Jesus prayed for in the last week of his life. University among all people who are diverse, finding the common denominator that makes us one thing. There is a religious teaching that says that God is for one group of people. That there are the chosen, and then there are the not chosen. Now, Jesus grew up in that teaching. That's what the ancient Jews believed. That Israel, the Israelites, were the chosen people. There was us, and there was them. You could be in, and you could be out. And that's what everybody believed in Jesus' day. And Jesus comes to bring into a, a whole different way of looking at how people relate and who people are. Question for you. What do you think is the single biggest problem that most people have with religion? I think it's because religion can seem so divided and religion puts people into groups who think different things. And then there is division in the world. I think a lot of people think religion causes division. There's Muhammad, there's Buddha, there's Christ, there's Confucius, there's the Hindu gods. You can add to that list. And all these religions tend to separate people into different groups who believe different things. I think that's what people, the problem that a lot of people have with religion. Well, forget about different religions. Even in the Christian churches, people can see sep uh, separation before unity. People see the differences between Presbyterians and United and Pentecostals. Some believe that salvation is this. Some believe that salvation is that. Some are pro-gay. Some are not pro-gay. People just see division even in the Christian church. It seems divided sometimes. And the story, the irony is that Jesus never once sought to divide people. Jesus' whole life was about bringing people together. One of the most definitive teachings of Christianity is a verse that you probably know. Most people know this verse, even though they might not be Christian. From the third chapter of John. For God so loved the world that he gave us Jesus that no one should perish. God so loved the world. God didn't just love one specific group of people. And Jesus came so that no one, and that means no one in the whole world, should perish. Everything that Jesus is attempts to bring people together. And of course people are, are diverse. It's not to say that people aren't diverse. But Jesus said, even in our diversity, we can find the common thread that runs through all people. This is such a well-known verse because it's at the heart of the Bible, and it's at the heart of Jesus, and it's the spirit, inclusivity, and that common denominator that makes his family. Well, Rob read a text from Acts in chapter 10. This is a really interesting story. It's about a vision that Peter had. And it has to do with how God looks at people and how people should relate to each other. Now, Peter was kind of like the lead disciple. This is the same Peter that betrayed, uh, denied Jesus three times before Jesus was killed. Peter ran off with all the other disciples before Jesus was killed. And when Peter has this vision, Jesus has gone, Jesus has left the earth, and Peter is on his rooftop in Jerusalem. That's interesting to know that rooftops in the Middle East, even to this day, are used as rooms. Oftentimes people will eat on rooftops, the dining room will be up there. So Peter's on his rooftop as this story begins, and he has a vision of a sheet coming down from God, a sheet hanging by its four corners. And this vision signals one of the most important shifts of thought and belief in all of Scripture. This vision of Peter forever changes Christianity's views of how people get along. So the sheet comes down out of heaven. I'll just remind you of the vision. Held up by its four corners. 
And in the sheet contained all different kinds of animals, including birds and reptiles. And God's voice said to Peter, kill and eat. Now, we have to understand that Jewish people didn't eat certain kinds of foods. Reptiles, birds, for instance, um, pigs, uh, pork they didn't eat. And so there's this voice of God that brings this, accompanies the sheep coming down, filled with animals of all different kinds. And the voice of God says to Peter, kill and eat. And Peter says, I don't think so, God, because that's against the law. And God says, I'm telling you, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter says, I don't think so, God. That's against the law. It happened three times. Peter, I'm telling you, kill and eat. I don't think so, God. I mean, in Peter's defense, he was just obeying his own laws. It's, it's the law he grew up with. It's the law that separated him from other people who do eat those kinds of foods. So as Peter's trying to figure out that vision in this passage that Rob read, he's trying to figure out the vision, there's a knock on the door. Peter goes downstairs, he opens the door, it's three Roman men standing there. Now, Romans and Israelites don't get along. I mean, Rome was the oppressor. So Peter opens the door, there's three Roman men standing there. This, in addition to that, they're Gentiles, which means they're unclean. Jewish people are not to have any relationship with Gentiles who are unclean. And then as, as, as uh, Peter is looking at those two men, the one says, our master Cornelius the centurion, requests that you come with us to hear what he has to say. Peter was in no hurry to go with these men. But then the Spirit of God, the voice of God said to Peter, go with them, for I have sent them. Now, it may not seem like a big deal today, but for Peter, these were two fundamental laws that God was asking him to break. Eating unclean food was fundamental to the Jewish people. And associating with Gentiles, particularly Romans who were oppressing them, was against a fundamental law. And by the end of Acts chapter 10, for Peter, the light finally goes on. And Peter realizes that what God intends to do is to take away any law that divides people. And to make a new law that says now there is no unclean and there's no clean. As Paul later says in, the, in letters of the New Testament, now there's no Gentile or Jew. It's gone. Now there's no black and white. There's no man or woman. There's no slave or free. All people will be equal in the eyes of God. Diverse? Yes. Of course diverse. People are all so different, but in the eyes of God, they're all equal. And God wants us to see all people as family. Now, it took the disciples, <laughs> this is amazing. Like, the disciples walked with Jesus for three years, but it took them a long time to get this. Because they were like Peter, they were just obeying the laws that they grew up with. And so many of those laws said you can't associate with these kinds of people and you can't, you can't engage in their traditions. That was just their law in their defense. So Jesus went out and he broke all those laws. He talked to Samaritan people. Jews weren't supposed to do that. Samaritans were unclean. Samaritans were half-breed. They used to be Jews, but then they bred with people. Who were, and, and Jews just weren't supposed to talk to them. And the disciples said, why are you talking to, to Samaritan people? And Jesus said, because God is for all people. And then he was invited into the homes of important people, like high priests and, and politicians and the important people in Judea and in Jerusalem. And oftentimes he went to eat with them, but just as many times he was invited into homes of people who were outcasts and sinners, people that nobody liked, people that cheated the culture, like tax collectors, and Jesus would eat with them too. And the disciples said, why are you eating with them? It's against the law to associate with them. And Jesus said, because God is for all people. And they're like, ah, oh, not again. A Roman centurion came to Jesus 
and said, my, my servant is sick, can you help him? And Jesus upheld this Roman centurion as having more faith than any of his disciples. And they said, why are you associating with him? And Jesus said, you know what he said. He did it with women. He included women in his inner circle. Men didn't include women in their inner circle then. 2,000 years ago in the Middle East, you could go to the Middle East today and find places that don't include women. But among Jesus' closest friends were women, Mary Magdalene and Martha and Mary and Joanna and Susanna. And the disciples said, why are you having women come into our supper table and eat with us? And Jesus said, "Before, because God is for all people. He did it with children. Children weren't welcomed at the feet of disciples. Jesus said, let the little children come. It's an endless list. Because God is for all people. You see the pattern. Pre-COVID, I would go into nursing homes and retirement homes, and Catherine Brown does that as well. And we go in and we uh, do some visiting, we do a, a worship service. Sometimes I'll bring my guitar in and I'll sing old Johnny Cash gospel songs like Peace in the Valley, or Do Lord, Do Lord, songs like that, Make the Circle Be Unbroken. And what I love to do when I do a worship service in a retirement home or in a nursing home is I get people to say what church they were from. Who's Baptist here? Hold up your hand. Baptists, we got Baptists. Anglicans, missionaries, Pentecostals are in the house, Church of God, everybody's putting their hand up. And then if I've forgotten any denomination, they put their hand up. And then we remind each other, after all that, that it doesn't matter anymore. Because when we are together in worship, every barrier that divides us come down. And all those people who have lived long, long years, I see them sitting there nodding their heads because their years of wisdom has taught them the truth of that. What a, won't it be a day? Won't it be a day when all barriers that divide us fall down? The Apostle Paul, one of the greatest disciples of Jesus, spent his life starting conversations with people who were different he started in Jerusalem. It's amazing that Paul traveled all the way to Athens, Greece, 2,000 years ago. He was shipwrecked. He was persecuted. He was beaten. He went all the way to Athens. He went even beyond Athens and Greece. He went to Rome and Italy. It was an incredible voyage for Paul. But when he, when he went to Athens in Greece, the reason he went to Athens is because he wanted to start a conversation with diverse people, with people who believe different things. Athens was the mecca of multiculturalism, different belief systems and faith, and different races, and he started conversations in marketplaces and in synagogues and wherever people met, he started conversations. And I want to show you a few words that Paul said to those people in Athens, Greece, after his long journey from Jerusalem. And notice in these words that Paul never judges people who are different. He never belittles them. He never says, I'm right and you're wrong. Instead, here's what he says. This is Acts 17, seven chapters after the, the chapter we read. People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. What he's saying, he's saying, I respect what you believe. You have a belief system, and I respect that. He goes on. The Lord who made the world, again, it's kind of this inclusive language. The Lord who made the world and everything in it, that means me, that means you, that means somehow we're a part of this together, is the Lord of heaven and earth. There's only one God, and there's only one God of all. From one man, from one man, God made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole world. That means we're family. God made me, God made you. Doesn't that mean in some way we must be brothers and sisters? God did this, listen, so that all people would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Paul doesn't say, I'm his offspring because I'm a Jesus follower. 
Paul says, we are his, his offspring. And Paul started the conversation that had the unity of humankind and the love for all people as the motive. And that's what Jesus did too. Go into diverse contexts and start a conversation with respect and with love for all humanity as, as your motive, regardless of race or religion. There are certain conversations that we can have with all people. How about this? Do you believe that compassion can change your life? Like, do you believe that if you are compassionate towards someone, you can raise up the things in them that have died? That's a conversation you can have with anybody. What about, do you believe that faith in a good future can have a good effect on your present? <laughs> you can talk about that with any race and any religion. Have that conversation. Do you believe that miracles can happen in people's lives when someone sacrifices something they have for someone else? Do you know what? There is no race and no religion in this world and no faith system that has not experienced that. And Paul goes to Athens. And then he's got enough energy left to go to Rome, which is where he dies. But he has that conversation with people who are so diverse. Different belief systems, different races. Finish with the story. If you go to this church, you've heard me talk about the railway, I tell railway stories. Here's, here's another one. I worked on the railway as a summer job when I was a university student in the early 80s. From Jasper all the way down through Central and then into Southern British Columbia, all the way down to Hope. It's God's country, it's gorgeous. And when I worked on the railway, I remember different things. I remember the tools we used. I remember 16-pound sledgehammers all day long. We'd just be swinging them, knocking off metal anchors off of the sides of ties. We'd just walk down the track swinging the 16-pound sledge. I remember the spiking hammers we used all day long. To the head on a spiking hammer is exactly the same, same size as the head of the spikes, so you have to know what you're doing. It takes some skill. Tie tongs, big tongs with pointed end, and you just grab the end of the tie and you drag it out from under the track all day long, just dragging ties out of the tie tongs. Lining bars, seven foot long metal bar about that thick, and you would take it, shove it under the track with 20 other men, and on three you'd hoist and you'd move the track a quarter inch every time you did that. That was called lining the track. I remember the tools. But way more than the tools, I remember the men I worked with. Railroad laborers are from all walks of life. I remember them all. I remember Eric and Serge. Eric was from Quebec. Serge was from New Brunswick. We would work 17 days in a row, and then we'd have four days off. And I remember Eric and Serge. They would work the 17 days, and when they got four days off, they'd go into the local town, and they would blow every penny and dollar they made in that 17-round cycle. I remember the immigrants I worked with, mostly Indian and Portuguese men. They came to Canada not even able to speak English, and they learned English on the railway. They learned railway English. The defining characteristic of railway English is that every other word is an expletive. And man, those guys could cuss up a blue streak. I've never heard people be more creative with bad words in my life. They didn't even know what they were saying were even words. They thought those words were all in the dictionary. I remember them all. I remember the ex-cons that would come out west to work on the railway. Because they couldn't find work anywhere else. I remember men who had warrants out for their arrest in Newfoundland and all through Quebec. And they'd come to the railway because it was just the best place to hide. And then there were university students like me and like others. All we wanted to do was work and save as much money as we could. Every now and again, I'd want to blow all my money too in a four day break, but I never did. One summer, I saved $7,000 which was a lot of money in 1982. And I got back, I remember, at the beginning of September, and I bought an old car, and I paid my tuition, and I had enough money left over for rent and for food for the whole, for the whole school, school year. 
I got to know those guys, working with them, swinging hammers with them, sweating through black fly season with them, dumping ballast with them, through clouds of blind dust sticking to every part of your body. And there is a brotherhood that happens when you work hard with other people, no matter how diverse they are. And what happens is that you get to see that there is a common thread that runs through all people. You realize that all people are the same, saints and sinners alike. You all feel the same cold. You all feel the same happiness when a long work day is over and you sit together and eat supper together. You all have the same hopes for a good future. You all have the same fears. As you, as you start to see all those things that, are, that you have in common, you realize that in some way you were family with those people because you discover sameness. People are all so different, yes, but they're all so the same. Somebody came to this church last year, walked in, sat down, sat through the service. After the service, they approached me and they said, I was really impressed. He smiled just like I'm smiling now. I said, good. And they said, oh, it, it's not the beauty of the sanctuary. The sanctuary is beautiful, but what in that? It wasn't that the music on that day was stirring. It was, but it wasn't that. It wasn't anything to do with the message. She said, it was okay, that was okay, but it wasn't that. He said so simply. It was the people. He said, not just middle class and not just poor, not just men, not just women, not just young, not just old. He said, not just ties and suits, not just jeans. He said, not just Jesus followers, not just people who are looking and curious. He said, it's like all different kinds of people are here. And he said, for that, that reason, I just find it a place that is alive and impressed. And I just thought to myself, this is great. This is just great because that's everything that Jesus was. That's everything that Jesus stood for. Jesus wanted crowds that represented more than one thing. Well, we can make that happen here. We have made it happen. And we will make it happen again when we ask God to come into that mix and help us. God has before. God will do that today. God will do that tomorrow. I wanted to end this talk today with a song. Uh, you know, I, I have to tell you, excuse my back just for a second, grab my guitar. I'm going to get um, Allison and Kimberly and Haley to come up too. They're going to help me. I heard this song on Friday. And I thought to myself, I absolutely have to do this song to finish my talk because it is just everything about, G about who Jesus is, including people, everything that I've been talking about. This is a song that Tom Chapin wrote. Now, Tom Chapin is Harry Chapin's brother. You remember Harry Chapin. Harry Chapin wrote Cats in the Cradle. Tom Chapin is now more of a children's entertainer, but he's written so many great songs and I heard this song, and I, th I thought, this isn't the, the hymn after the sermon. <laughs> we're going to do that. But I thought, we're going to do it, and uh, I'm just going to sing the verse, and then they're going to come in and help me. This is called, We Will Not Stop Singing. Oh 